without our environment, without the, the structures that our life actually depends on, we are nothing. No amount of money, no amount of success, nothing matters at the moment. It's just our physical beings in our rawest and purest form. My name is Lena Hedsberg. I believe in the power of storytelling to help us cross the divide and to connect as human beings, but also to nature. And today we have someone very special talking with us, um, Greta Iori, half Italian, half Ethiopian, based in London, um, a global citizen in many ways, but also a passionate uh, wildlife conservationist. And uh, you've been specifically focusing on wildlife crime. Um, it's always quite intriguing the way one says wildlife crime and what, what does that mean? So why don't you start by setting the scene for us? You know, what, yeah. you know, what's the crime scene here? Yes, so having grown up in Ethiopia, I was really brought up with the love and passion of the African savannah. So I stepped into the world of natural resource management and nature conservation. And my first job was in a national park called the Simeon Mountains National Park. Um, and I, as it was one of the biggest tourism parks for the country, not so much for the big five and so on, but for the beautiful landscape and the endemic species that we find in Ethiopia, I started to see some of the challenges that were being faced. And one of the big ones was the conflict between humans and wildlife. And whether that meant the conflict between livelihoods, like villagers and communities using the space for grazing and then you know, breaking the laws by grazing within the park or having animals such as leopards eating their livestock and then retaliatory killing happening because of it. So this is how it all began. It started really with for my passion to protect big areas and the wildlife that live within it. So I, I grew up in Kenya and South Africa um, to a, into a hunting family. So we spent a lot of time in the bush as well and, yeah. Yeah. and uh, on reserves. Uh, and then later on, I've moved far, in, far more into the social issues. And, and I think the, the conflict that I've also seen, I've, I've often thought of myself of living in some of the communities that surround some of these nature reserves that are protected with big electrical fences, which is just as much to keep the animals in as it is to keep the people out. Yeah. Um, but then you realize that at night, they, the villagers they, or the communities, they, they of course, they've spent their lives with living off the land or with their animals and they sneak yep. in and set up snares to try and get food. And I think if I was living in that community, there's a very big chance that I would do that too if it meant the livelihood of my family. How do you deal with that conflict of, of communities and people who feel perhaps entitled to that land um, on one side and needing to sustain their families and literally get food on the table? One of the biggest challenges of our time when it comes to wildlife conservation and the, space, the conservation of natural spaces is the dynamics between the increasing, ever increasing populations that live alongside them and for centuries have been using those spaces sustainably. But because of the way development works, because of the way the industrial development works as well, we have kind of cornered these communities out of the very areas that sustain their livelihoods without replacing their livelihoods with something else. And this is the biggest issue we're facing. If we can't create benefits for the very people who live alongside those spaces, there will never be a positive outcome. And there will always be some form of conflict, some form of retaliation against the system. And that's not to say that they're unaware of the value, but just like you said, if you were in that position, you would be doing the exact same thing. It's, it's survival very often for those communities. They're at the very bottom of the chain of income. And I've always said that if we don't include local communities' needs, if we don't include local communities' knowledge and awareness and, and provide them a space and a platform to bring out their opinion and what they would like to do and how they'd like to engage, we're, it's just going to be a losing battle. And that's a, essentially what's, what's been happening in a lot of these, especially the really big wildlife economies like South Africa, like Kenya and Tanzania, where there's a few people gaining a lot from the wildlife economy, whether it's uh, you know tour operators, uh, luxury safaris, or any of those industries, 
but the communities are really, really paying a huge price, whether it comes to conflict with the animals themselves or just not having another op an alternative and having to commit crimes in order to survive. But tell us more about your experience with, with poachers and how we should be careful with how we stigmatize and demonize the poachers. Absolutely. It's so interesting you bring this up because just like you, I felt there was a missing link. There was definitely a silenced voice in the media rhetoric around poachers and the wildlife crime in general was very, very strongly against the very low level guys. These guys and these women and anyone that's engaging in it either is completely from pure need because they're not part of any other livelihood structure and it's impossible for them to engage in another way to survive or if they were framed. So a lot of these people were being put, you know, blackmailed by much higher authorities, whether they were landowners that owned the private reserves, whether they were international criminals, whether it was their own governments and leader, leadership within the communities, that if they didn't commit these crimes, that they would be exposed or killed or arrested or framed. And therefore, a lot of times you must realize that it's a dynamic of access. Who is really leading this? Because for every poacher you put behind bars or kill or remove from the equation, there'll be hundreds of thousands others that can replace them. But who are the guys, the kingpins and the syndicates that are driving this whole thing? Those are the real criminals. Because without them, none, none, nobody on the ground would be able to even sell whatever product it is that they're killing an animal for. So that's where I really think a lot has been missing on the media. Yeah. And then an animal that is closer to your heart, the elephants. Yes, so the elephant has really become my prized animal, but not because I prefer any wild animal to any other, but because I really resonate a lot with how elephants live, how they lead each other, how they engage with each other. It's very, very human, and therefore it's very easy to find love in how they are. And also the fact that it's led by matriarchs or women, it's a woman-led herd. It's very inspiring for me. It reminds me that when you put women in charge, you can really create amazing things and the dynamics between the relationship fascinates me. But if you never have seen these, these enormous creatures in the wild, like mm. what could you share like a, a personal memory or a, a moment that, that somehow touches you and that you'll always hold with you oh, when yes, it comes to actually. elephants? So when I was in the bush tracking elephants in, in South Africa, I was washing some clothes, completely living far away from civilization and always kind of with one eye open because you never knew what might be within your vicinity. In that moment though, I was kind of just really relaxed, not looking up. And a friend of mine who was working with me was about maybe 10 meters behind me and he starts whispering my name and he's like, Greta, don't panic, but look up. And I look up and there's this huge matriarch, this beautiful elephant, probably three meters high, tall. And she's about maybe two and a half meters away from me with this tiny fence just looking at me. And I'm crouched down, so I, I'm literally a tiny ant. And then there's this big elephant. And I look up and I see the feet as soon as I look up and I, my heart starts pounding, you know, because although they're called gentle giants, they're really, really quite terrifying creatures. They're, they're massive animals. And when you're in their presence, you have a sense of respect and fear because you realize how small and helpless and vulnerable you really are. It's such a scary feeling. There's nothing around me and obviously I don't want to startle her. So I look up, but then I feel that I have to respect her, but also stand my ground. That's what we're taught when we're in the wild. If you ever come into contact with any dangerous animals, you should stand your ground and, and show your confidence, even if you're faking it. <laughs> so I stand up and I look her straight in the eyes and it's, for me, it's almost like time stopped. And it was a very calm, but beautiful connection where she, with her eyes showed me, you know, I'm not gonna hurt you. Um, I respect that you've, you know, risen to the occasion and you haven't <laughs> run away. So we stood there and that is a feeling that reminds me that we're all one. We're all living creatures. We all understand each other on, on, a, on a species level. There's a level of respect and understanding and love that I try and, and, and wish people could feel more because then they would recognize that wild animals, just because they don't look like us, they don't speak like us, 
doesn't make them any different to us. Without our environment, without the, the structures that our life actually depends on, we are nothing. No amount of money, no amount of success, nothing matters at the moment. It's just our physical beings in our rawest and purest form. Um, and I think that is something that we've lost touch with over the many years. And in nature is how we all reconnect to that. Whether you're a really successful CEO, whether you have a big mansion at home, none of that matters when you come face to face with nature. What What is your hope when we've, we've had this moment, or we're having this moment of pause, although it's not without suffering for many of people. Um, yeah. When one, re- when one comes to the afterlife of this time that we're in now with coronavirus, what is your hope in terms of how we, our relationship to nature should be? My hope is that we don't forget where the coronavirus first stemmed from, which is a crucial piece of advice that people are not really focusing on. It all stemmed from the illegal wildlife trade and our consumption of it and, our, and, and, not reg, and no regulation of it. So all these pandemics and infectious diseases start from us unnaturally engaging and consuming wild animals and destroying habitats that we're not meant to as creatures. There's, it shows the lack of harmony in our current system. So c- coming out of this, I really hope that we don't forget the root cause of this and that we don't just treat the symptoms. We need to change the way we live our lives. We need to change the way we engage with our planet on the g- greater scale, not just with wild animals, but forests, ecosystems, climate change is a huge threat that persists. So how are we going to move forward from this and make the world a better place is a real important question that we all ask ourselves in our consume and um, consumption ways, the way that we consume. How are we going to fund lives and give life to products that actually do better for the world rather than just because you want it, you buy it and don't even think about the supply chain. So I'm hoping that if we have anything to gain from this really, really harsh lesson, and it is a harsh lesson, but there's a lot of suffering and it isn't even over, it's just started, um, is that I hope it helps us see a light for having the need to build a better world for everyone, not just singular people or economies or, or, or communities, everyone needs to engage differently with this planet. And I think we, we really feel that now.